Coast, Roland Martin here. We are broadcasting live from Los Angeles at the site of XQ America Live. Well, the next hour, we're going to be talking about education, the importance of it, but also how you can also be a difference maker when it comes to uh, rethinking, how we rethink high school, but also how we impact our children, elementary school, middle school, and high school as well. Over the next hour, you're going to hear from a number of people, including Ruslan Ali, who is with XQ America. You might remember her. Of course, worked for the Department of Education. Also, uh, Naomi Campbell is also will be here talking about how important education reform is to her as well. Plus, uh, Dr. Steve Perry, of course, he has several uh, charter schools uh, in Connecticut, also working with Diddy in Harlem. He'll join us to talk about uh, students and do they reach a point where they literally stop learning? He's going to give you some research that they have uncovered in their various schools. We'll also talk about uh, Donald Trump, his education budget. They dropped the budget this week. Massive cuts in the Department of Education. How will that impact our children, especially African Americans? We'll talk with Tiffany Lofton, uh, who leads the uh, Youth and College Division of the NAACP. And so, folks, over the next hour, it's going to be a jam-packed show uh, from L.A. It's time for us to bring the funk. I'm Roller Martin Unfiltered, the special edition. With SQ America. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. All right, folks, uh, we are here in Los Angeles with the folks from XQ America for the XQ America live event taking place uh, tonight. Uh, why is this important? Because XQ America is all about education, causing us to rethink how we uh, educate our children. And so they've had some major initiatives that we've covered over the last couple of years. Uh, and so we want to talk about, of course, what they are doing and also what this event is about and also uh, give you some critically important information uh, when it comes to your children. Uh, education is, as we say on my show all the time, the civil rights issue of the 21st century. Uh, and so for so long for African Americans, uh, dating back to even before slavery, it's about how do we educate our children. And so we can take this thing all the way through, of course, uh, Jim Crow, where we are today, uh, where you have today for the first time, majority of kids in public schools are black and brown. And the question is, are our school systems failing them? And how can we reverse that? We look at some of the education numbers, uh, dismal, but the question is, can we improve it? We have experts tonight who are going to say absolutely we can. So uh, over the next hour, we'll be talking about that. We also want to uh, hear from you. I'll be monitoring the feeds. Of course, folks who are watching on YouTube, Periscope, as well as Facebook, I'll be seeing your comments. Uh, you can also uh, tweet those to me as well. I'll have that up as well. And so we got uh, four different devices going at one time uh, to get your comments. But right now, though, uh, let's get right into it. I got my, three of my guests right here. So I want to start, first off, uh, to my uh, left, we have, of course, Eric Whalen, co-founder of DaVinci rise also carrie croft with us as well and nadeska alexis host of super school live now first off what is da vinci rise what is that yeah so da vinci rise is a, a brand new high school here in los angeles we're in our second year and we were um we were created to specifically meet the needs of homeless foster and probation youth mm -hmm. um who even within this kind of larger conversation we're having about educational inequity and students who aren't being served um they are even more likely um, to be neglected um, in education, have diff more, more difficulties and challenges um, that they face in terms of accessing an equitable education, a rigorous curriculum. And so we, we worked with students to create a high school to better meet their needs. So this is your second year. So yes. are you part of the traditional public school system? Are you a charter school? Are you a private school? Exactly what kind of school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're a charter school. Yes. We're a charter school. Okay, and so uh, the genesis of that, and so where did uh, the idea start from? Uh, did, did you look at uh, what the problems were and then say, you know what, we need something that's, that's specially created for this population? 
Yeah, so Aaron and I both started in the classroom as high school teachers, and we were kind of seeing similar issues uh, on opposite sides of the country. High school teachers here in Los Angeles. I was here in Los Angeles. And I, I'm born and raised from here, but I was in Miami. Okay. Yeah, and so we started seeing similar issues, and then our paths crossed um, about four or five years into being into the classroom. We started having conversations and realizing that we really wanted to work with students to create a better experience for them, one that was really... Um, kind of fitting the, the school around their needs rather than force fitting them into a system that wasn't made for them to begin with. Now, such schools are not um, uh, out of the norm. I mean, when I was, uh, I, I, I grew up in Houston, Houston Independent Public School System, uh, and unfortunately, they always call such schools alternative schools. Uh, and so why did you choose this name as opposed to something that sounds like it's sort of reform school? I think a huge piece of the puzzle is that we're trying to provide equity for students who have never seen their, their needs being met, and that is often why. So in thinking about how to best meet their needs and best kind of make them feel empowered and wanting to go to school and wanting to feel like, like they, they belong there, we have to change the narrative. We have to stop saying that you failed out because you didn't meet our needs as educators and say that we actually failed you by not meeting your needs as students, as people, as human beings, and thinking about kind of the hierarchy of needs. If students are hungry, if they don't have stability in their household, if they don't have what they need, then obviously they're not going to be able to perform and learn. Um, and so how do we reverse that? How do we use our systems and kind of interact together to make sure that they have that? And, and what, are you, what are you specifically seeing? Um, the difference between the students you serve and, and, and versus other students. First of all, how many students in your school? We have about 160 students right now across two locations. Okay. Yeah. And so, and so, what is that the, the chief difference that you see in those type of, the students you serve versus uh, students in other uh, sure. traditional schools? Well, I think to your point earlier, we we already know that black and brown students already have more difficulty accessing equitable education just by by virtue of the schools in their neighborhoods um, and also students from low socioeconomic backgrounds. And then our students, in addition to that, um, they are, um, those students are disproportionately represented in the foster system and the probation system and housing instability. And so for a lot of our students, they've had a great deal of transiency. They've attended sometimes upwards of four or five different high schools. Um, our students may have five to six different placements, just housing placements over the course of the year. And so they were experiencing pretty significant disruptions in their educational journeys. All right, yeah. I want to bring in Nadeska here. So you are the host of Super School Live. So for folks who don't know what that means, explain that. So it's really amazing. I'm just here to warm up the audience, but essentially they're a series of writers and they're coming up and presenting these amazing stories about high schoolers across the country. Uh, they're well researched and there's uh, graphics, there's video with it. So for example, one will profile a high school where uh, a teacher is having his kids help find clues about a serial killer. So it's really not traditional education. There's one about um, a young food critic, but he's um, a critic of his cafeteria high school food. So it's just sort of like seeing the different ways education can take shape to keep kids engaged, not the very traditional boring education that some of us unfortunately had to suffer through. And uh, when, for folks who don't know, of course, uh, XQ America went uh, for a couple of years with this, with this program, a, re a Rethink High School, mm -hmm. uh, and handed out a significant amount of money for folks who had very creative ideas. Uh, because one of the issues that, that, that we've all seen is that the reality is we have a standard way we educate. Right. And it is, it is still the same way mm -hmm. that it was 150 years ago. Uh, and so you have a new type of student, new generation. Uh, and so uh, how critically important is it for us to say, hey, you have to, you can't have a cookie cutter approach. Mm -hmm. you, if you might have 50 different high schools in the system, you might have to have 50 different types of way of teaching as opposed to saying one, replicate. Right, because absolutely, I think kids, if they're not engaged, they tend to drop out of school. A lot of the smartest kids that I went to high school with were the ones who dropped out. Just because they weren't challenged enough, the curriculum was very boring, but I think, like, um, it's very important. I grew up in a working-class immigrant family, and education was always a priority, but in the very archaic, go to school, get A's kind of way. So maybe because I was terrified of my mom, it worked. But for some people, not so much. And my teachers had a huge influence on my life. My career in music journalism would not have happened without them, because I wouldn't have even considered it as a possibility. So I think we, it's really important that we change it. Kids need to know that there are different careers out there, not just the things that you may see on TV, the very traditional jobs. I think it's very important. Um, in the two years, first of all, are you serving uh, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior? So all four. Um, what have you seen in terms of growth of these students in two years? Well, well, you know, give us a sense of how it's changed them and helped them. 
So we always start with the students with just social emotional awareness and understanding the ways in which they have been disturbed, understanding how they can process their emotions and, and regulate, because that's where students are getting kicked out and getting in trouble, especially in these systems that we're talking about. And so seeing the growth in something as as small as attendance um, and seeing kids come consistently say, oh, I actually feel safe here. I actually feel like I can ask and seek out adult help. That changes everything because you can't teach a student until they feel safe and they can learn. And so there's so many disruptions that are happening. And if they don't feel that way, then we can't actually access them. I think also in addition to that, seeing where they can begin to create their own curricular journey. So to your point around how do we kind of tailor the needs to each of the kids, many of our kids know what they need to learn. A lot of our kids are parents. A lot of our kids have to understand a budget. And so when you put that into the math curriculum, you put that into the social studies curriculum to look at, okay, how do you navigate the world? The interest level shoots up because it's actually things, a lot of them don't have the privilege of just being a student. They also have to be adults. And so kind of thinking about how we listen to kids and, and leverage student voice allows them to really find a place in, in the school. All right. I would agree with that, and I think once they start to feel safe at school, when they feel like they have multiple adults on campus who they trust, who believe in them, who can support them, then we really start to see the increase in academics as well. And so we have some students who have attended multiple high schools before they land with us and may have earned zero credits, all Fs, for three years. They're earning more credits with us over a course of two to three quarters than they have in their previous two to three years combined. Uh, and then we also do get to see some of the benefits of that socio-emotional growth and the, and the wraparound services. Just today we had a student get off probation. She's been on probation for five years and today she her probation was terminated and so that obviously opens up a whole new pathway right. for her and her future as well. Nesca, this is not the only city uh, y'all are doing this. Where else are you going? Um, so we've already, they've done Tennessee, Chicago is coming up, I believe we'll be out in Seattle and Tacoma, Washington, so there's still a few more exciting stops. Pharrell is doing a music festival in Virginia Beach coming up on April 25th, and uh, XQ is also going to be doing a live show there, which will be really exciting. All right, then, we surely appreciate it. Uh, continue uh, good luck in all that you're doing. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, Roland. You. Thank you so all much. right, then. Uh, again, folks, uh, we are here uh, in uh, Los Angeles uh, with XQ America. One of the things that, of course, you know, you often hear us talk about uh, on Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, is how do we impact those in the classroom? For the last couple of years, I have participated uh, in a couple of sessions with Dr. Monica George Fields. Uh, she's president and CEO of Reach Educational Solutions, and she spent 31 years uh, in the classroom turning around uh, many troubled schools. And what she says, point blank, it points to leadership, commitment, but also making it perfectly clear uh, to her teachers that she simply will not accept uh, a lower standard. She joins us live right now uh, from New York. Doc, doc, Dr. Monica, how you doing? Hi, how you doing, Roland? I am doing. I am doing great. Glad to have you here. Uh, first and foremost, so, so for our audience who's watching, walk them through the school that you took over in New York uh, and how bad of a shape it was in when you took it over. So um, I was offered at the time six schools, and I wanted to take the school the most work. The school I took was in Harlem. I had eighteen hundred students in it. I was the fifth principal in five consecutive years. I had um, 13 self-contained special education classes. I had 81 classes all together. This is all in one building. So it was really interesting to hear your previous guests talk about 150, 180 students across two sites. I had 1,800 students in Harlem. And um, the ELA and math scores were at 9 and 13 uh, percent. Uh, respectively. So 9% ELA and 13% across the school proficiency rates. And um, I had teachers, I had over 20 teachers who had not gotten their permanent certification from ranging from 15 to 24 years in that building. So they taught between 15 and 24 years with temporary teaching licenses. And I didn't have the opportunity to reconstitute the school. I walked in and I had what I had. I had the 1,800 students and I had all of their families and all of the teachers who had worked in that school for many years and all they knew was struggle. And Monica, you had people who basically told you, these children cannot succeed. These are the worst of the worst. So you know what? Let's just do the best job that you can. And your attitude was, I can't accept your idea of failure. 
Absolutely. I had people who said, you know, we're just trying to just stay out of the newspaper. We're just trying to make sure that we don't have any incidents in the school as we normally would have. I had the police department um, perched on the roof of the building, scoping out the crack uh, den that was next door to the school. And they just wanted me to keep the lid on the boiling pot. And I said, I couldn't live with that. I grew up in Harlem. My, uh, as you know, uh, my brother, one of my brothers uh, grew up to be a functional illiterate. And so I knew what that felt like as a sister, as uh, a community member, to have people that I knew that could not read or write and went through the school system. And um, I, I just didn't know how to tell a parent that we were producing kids who were more likely to go to jail or die or um, be single parents or struggle in life rather than kids who are going to have a future. I didn't know how to have that conversation with parents. I didn't want to. And I told my staff, we cannot accept what is going on in this building. We must do something to turn it around. Um, one of the issues that we also have, obviously, uh, when it comes to um, education, you're also dealing with bureaucrats and you're dealing with their perspective and you're dealing with what they think as well. How did you also basically manage up? How did you let them know that, look, this is what needs to happen to change the condition of this school, to be able to get these kids to, uh, to be educated? Uh, how did you let them know that you have expectations for them? I, I told them point blank, there's a hill that every school leader needs to understand that they may die on. And the hill I was willing to die on was not to allow other people to come into the school and distract us from the work that needed to be done. I had a clear plan for how I was going to improve that school. And anyone who entered that building knew that I had a plan. And if you weren't there to add value, and that's, the, that's what REACH does, we add value to whatever school building we go into, then you didn't need to be there. Um, and so I got into, you know, um, tough conversations with my, my superintendent and assistant superintendents. And I made it very clear that results come from focused, intentional work, not from distractions. And uh, as long as I had a plan and I was working the plan and I got buy-in from my teachers and the families and the staff, I um, was allowed to do what I needed to do, but I did have a firm foot at the door of not letting just anyone into the building. It was very important that I guarded my school from distractions. Okay, so you're no longer in the classroom. You have Reach Educational Solutions. Uh, and what is, tell folks what that is and what you're trying to do uh, when it comes to uh, teachers. So Reach Educational Solution is an education firm that I started after I was this, the uh, senior fellow for innovation in New York State working with John King and Merrill Tisch. And it's a firm that's committed to working with schools, particularly schools that are serving students who are underserviced, underperforming, and struggling schools around um, increasing academic achievement. And we do that through supporting, mentoring, coaching teachers in particular, and school leaders. We do, uh, we help uh, school leaders and district leaders with strategic plans, action plans, but most of all, we go into the classroom and we coach in, which is what I did in my school. I, you could find me in the classroom talking to teachers, coaching teachers, professionally developed teachers, developing teachers, no matter how dynamic a school leader is, the bottom line is that they are not in front of all of their students every day, all day. You've got to get to the people who are closest to the students, and those are the teachers, and they need to be developed. The students who are the most struggling have teachers who are the most, uh, who are in need of the most training and the most coaching, and that's what REACH Educational Solution um, provides to to schools, uh, not only in New York, but um, across the country in Detroit, um, in Wisconsin and other places. And every year we have an annual conference where we encourage people to come and have conversations about what's going on with uh, race, poverty and the achievement gap. 
And uh, that's our focus for 2020. Uh, where are we with closing the achievement gap 65 years after Brown versus Board of Education? And last point, you absolutely believe that the achievement gap can be closed. Absolutely. I, I saw it. I, I, I saw it happen in my school. I'm not one of these these uh, school leaders who's angry because I think people should look at listen to me. Yet I didn't have the results. I actually got the results in my school in that school where we were at nine and 13 percentile. When I left that school, that fifth grade graduating class was a 90, 90, 90 class, 90 percent minority, 90 percent title one and performing 90 percent on ELA and math at the state at the state level. And so I absolutely not only do I believe it, I know it can happen. And we've helped numerous schools um, actually get their schools off the improvement list and increase academic achievement with our children. All right. And Monica, so let folks know uh, if they're interested in how they can reach you at Reach Educational Solutions. So they can um, contact us at contact us at Reach edsolutions.com. They can join us at our conference, um, 65 Years Post Brown versus Board of Education, where we were closing the achievement gap in February 2020. We'll be in Orlando, Florida. If you contact us at the email, we'll send you the information that you need. Um, or they can uh, follow us on Twitter at Contact Us Reach. Um, they can there and, and they can come to our website, www.reachedsolutions.com. Um, there are many ways that they can contact us. And I encourage any school leader, community based organization, family member who wants really have a conversation about improving academic achievement with um, our black and brown students. Please contact us. Join us for our annual conference in February 2020. Um, and, um, and, and we're there, we, we will travel. We're a national organization. So we will go to any district, any school. There's no school too large and no school too small for us to make an impact. All right. Dr. Monica George Fields. I certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, folks. Um, you heard our previous guests talk about wraparound services. You heard Monica talking about uh, uh, closing the achievement gap and how uh, any child can actually be taught, can actually learn. Well, Jeffrey Canada also believes in that. He is the founder of the Harlem Children's Zone. He has worked with the folks here with XQ America uh, from the beginning of their Rethink High School initiative. Uh, and here's a video that they put together that I think is important for you to hear from Jeffrey himself. My mom was always sick. I had to be grown at a young age. I had to pay bills. Teachers in my other schools, they don't know that. How can Rethinking High School help us achieve a more equitable America? We're trying to teach all young people as if they come to us from the same starting place. Uh, and they don't. It's not fair. High schools are really, right now, the source and engine of mobility in our society. We need to prepare all students for the workforce and for college in the 21st century. Everyone has to care whether our country maintains being a country of opportunity for everyone. High school is the ticket. It's the golden ticket. If you get it, you have a future. If you miss it, your life chances are greatly diminished. We really have to think about how do we develop these individuals into adults and what is our responsibility. School districts with the most students of color have $2,000 less per student to spend than school districts with the most white students. I used to just go to the back of the classroom, just sit down. Here is like a relationship with a teacher, you know, it's, instead of like, do it, it's like, hey, how you doing, you okay? We should have a zero tolerance for failure and inequity for our schools in this country. We can't start thinking these kids aren't gonna make it. Every young person who walks through this building has been through obstacles that I couldn't even imagine. America stands for the fact that your talents should take you as far as they can take you. It's possible for us to create those kind of environments in every single community in this country if we decide to do so.
we can equip every student for 21st century success. All right, we certainly thank Jeffrey Canada for that. Folks, uh, again, uh, let me just go ahead and say this. This is what is critically important. Uh, we talk about all kind of stuff all day. If we were talking about Donald Trump or Jesse Smollett or R. Kelly, you know what? A lot of more folks would be tuning in. A lot of more folks would be sitting here commenting. But this is the most fundamental issue facing our community and facing this country uh, as we speak. This is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. We must absolutely care about it, which is why we are focused over the next hour uh, specifically on just this issue of education. We could have talked about, uh, of course, anything else, but we wanted to make sure that we gave it le this level of attention uh, as uh, we speak. Uh, so I've got a couple other guests right now. Uh, I'm going to have them introduce themselves. How y'all doing? Good. How are you? You are? Monique Pena Circulos <laughs> at um, Santa Ana, Santa Ana Unified School District. My name is Alexis Benitez. I'm a sophomore at uh, Circulos in Santa Ana. All right, so I'm going to start with you since you are a sophomore. Um, this whole initiative with Excuse about rethinking high school and causing us to think differently, uh, as uh, a high school student, um, do you see the difference in your classmates when education is approached in a much more creative and innovative way as opposed to what you may have been used to in elementary school, middle school? Yes, I see the difference a lot. I see that now um, I have at my school at Circulos, we have the chance, we have a whole hour where we'll be able to choose or what we want to work on. Um, this is just great because you're independent, you become more independent of and more responsible of your work. Yes, we have the, the amazing teachers that are always like telling us and reminding us what to do, but it's that time where you're able to be responsible and be able to choose what you want to work on. And I just think like from the difference between my high, my high school from my middle school, is just before I used to be stuck in a room with a book and with a teacher explaining me stuff. Now I'm able to explore things by myself and question more and go more into detail of what I want to learn. How do, we, how do we get parents to care more? Because you look at all these surveys, people always say all oh, education is the number one issue. Every time somebody's running for office, education is the number one issue. Then all of a sudden, you look at who attends PTA meetings, uh, you look at who's showing up for parent-teacher conferences, and people complain, but they're not necessarily there all the time for their kids. I think um, one thing that, te that parents can do is just think about like what do they need for their students to be able to be prepared for a 21st century world. So like in order to survive with technology and, and social media and just everything just kind of clashing at our students on a rapid pace nowadays, what is what are the skills that our students need in order to navigate that, in order to really survive with the constant changing of times? No longer is education the same where traditional um, classrooms are really preparing our students for not only college but also for career as well and so I think asking parents what is it that they think that their students truly need in order to be successful in a 21st century world I think is the best way to get them hooked for this. If you had the ability to craft the curriculum what would you want to see or how would you want to see it being taught if you were in power? Oh yes a high school sophomore in power. <laughs> oh there's so many things oh my god um, I, I think I would start by saying, like, I don't know, I actually don't know. There's so many things I, I could do, but I don't know. Just start it, with one, just start with one. Can you repeat that question again? Yeah, what, what, if you would try the curriculum, how would you want to see classes being taught? How would you want to see uh, the focus when it comes to education? I think every kid, every child, every kid learns different and he's just learned like, my teacher, Miss Peña, she is always saying like, oh, she teaches, but she let us do things in our own. And I think that's something every single teacher should do. And just like the way I think, uh, just by the, the teachers being more aware of what the students are, how the students learn, it's more important of how the, how the kids learn. Because if that kid is comfortable learning with the teacher or learning by themselves, I, that's where they're gonna learn. Otherwise, they are not gonna learn. Uh, so I think it's more of, right now, we're using technology a lot. So it's more being aware of what technology, how we're using technology. So at schools, it will be like, uh, 
learning how to use and uh, navigating technology correctly and teachers being aware of what their students are like how they learn final question for you um as we talk about rethinking high school but also middle school and elementary school what do you want to see change from top down right yeah that's difficult um there definitely needs to be a lot more um policy changes that are going to vertically align, meaning from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. Um, I'm a high school teacher, so um, it's really easy to say like, oh, my job is to prepare students for college and for career, but I wonder if elementary and middle school teachers are really thinking the same way, right? Do they have that same mindset? If um, the way in which they're using technology and the skills that they're really building out for their students, is it preparing them not just for maybe like the next grade level or like the next school, middle school or high school, but is what they're doing and implementing in the classrooms is it really um, helping our students to be successful um, in a lot of these like um, career and college way college pathways that are going to really help them out because some of our students we had a lot of opportunities even as high school students mm -hmm. um, and some students are realizing that with Instagram and other social media means they can have a lot of careers and they can start working as entrepreneurs at such an earlier age um, by asking that question I think it's really helpful all right well I certainly appreciate it thank you so very much for being here thank uh, good luck thank you all right thank you very much Again, folks, we're here for XQ America's uh, Super School, their, their live initiative. It's actually a program they're actually going to be doing. And so, uh, but this is all about education. This is not just, this is not about uh, competing charter schools versus traditional schools. No, this is all forms of education, what it means, how it impacts our children, uh, because this is a future. You hear me talk about this all the time. We are 24 years away from America being a nation, majority of people of color. That means that African Americans, Latinos, Asians, and Native Americans will make up 53% of this country. Yet, if you look at the current stats, the reading stats, uh, the math stats, they are woeful. I was recently in Atlanta uh, for our school choice is the Black Choice Town Hall event. There was an elementary school in Atlanta, folks, where 5% of the students, this is a black elementary school, 5% of the school's students were reading on grade level. I'm going to repeat that. In Atlanta, the Mecca, elementary school there, black elementary school, 5% of the children were reading on grade level. So you then have to ask the question, what's going to happen when they're in middle school? What's going to happen when they are in high school? Will they ever be able to catch up? Will they ever be able to be on grade level? Or will they be consigned for the entire life of being behind? That's something that we all must understand and think about. It is something my next guest deals with all the time. Joining us right now is Dr. Steve Perry. Uh, very much involved. Uh, you've heard him on the show many times. Uh, prominent educator uh, involved in all sorts of uh, things. He, of course, has uh, several schools now. His own schools in Connecticut, in Harlem. He's aligned himself with uh, Sean Diddy Combs. Also, they're, they're now pursuing a second school. So welcome to uh, this education special of Roland Martin Unfiltered with XQ America. Steve Perry, how you doing, bro? Thank you so much, Rep and C. Prep. So, Steve, the other day you and I were talking. First of all, you and I talk all the time. We're always talking about education. We're always talking about uh, how we can keep pushing the needle, how we can keep challenging people. And you said something that blew me away because it blew you away, and that is this idea of our kids may stop learning. I explain that because when we were talking, man, I was like, yo, this is crazy. This is the most frightening statistic that I've ever seen in education. So we have children in our schools in uh, in our school in um, Harlem who come from all five boroughs. So it's not just Harlem. They come from all five boroughs. And we start in the sixth grade. And 99% of the children are reading, writing, and doing math below grade level. 99%. You, you couldn't hit a spot on the wall nine out of ten times unless you did it on purpose. You couldn't miss that many times unless you were god-awful. So what we found is that those kids are about two grade levels below, typically. So the sixth graders are coming in at the fourth grade level. What I presumed is that if we took kids in the seventh grade, they'd be at the fifth grade, and at the eighth grade, they'd be at the sixth grade. And we accept children all the way up to the 12th grade. We have schools in Connecticut and in New York. 
And what we're finding is that there's something that I'm calling um, stagnation, that there's actually a end point where the children stop learning. So we're taking children in at the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade who have stopped progressing somewhere around the fifth grade. So we're taking in 10th graders who are reading at about the sixth grade, not the eighth grade, which would be consistent with the two grade levels behind that, the, that we were accepting them at. But they're stagnating. What we're finding is that the longer that they're staying in failed school systems, which are typically the neighborhood schools within which they are zoned, they actually stop learning. It's not that they stop being able to learn because then what I've also seen, Roland, is that when we pull these students into our, our school, even the kids that we take in the 12th grade are moving a year to a year and a half in the course of a year. But in the course of their academic experience in the traditional school setting, somewhere along the way between the people who are teaching them and the children themselves, somewhere between them, they've actually stagnated. And they become recalcitrant to the point where 75% of all children who cannot read at grade level by the time they are in third grade will never read on grade level in their life. What does that look like? What that looks like is a city like Memphis, which is an amazing town in which over a third of the adults are functionally illiterate. What's functionally illiterate mean? It means that if you gave them a cereal box, they couldn't read the ingredients. It means that if you, t if you went to church and you asked them to read the morning announcements, they can't read the morning announcements. That's what we're looking at. And I found this accidentally, uh, Roland, as you and I talked about it. I was looking at some of the data from some of our students, and I was thinking that when we accept kids in the 10th grade, they should be reading at the 8th grade level. But most of them were somewhere around the 5th grade. And I thought, well, then if we're taking kids in the 11th grade, they should be reading somewhere around the 9th grade. And they're somewhere around the 6th grade. They stop growing by full grades somewhere around the 5th or 6th grade. They're only growing incrementally. When I say incrementally, I'm talking about months over the course of years, which is the equivalent of not growing at all. This to me, Steve, is, this is the, the, the thing. This is Steve, one second. The, the thing that for me, it, it, it was just so mind boggling is that I'm trying to people to understand that if that child today is 10, in 24 years, when we have majority of nation people of color, they're not going to be 34 years old. They're not, they not going to be in a position to be able uh, to have the kind of jobs we want. Now you talk about the issue of the ability to be able to own a home. Now you talk about the inability to be able uh, to create wealth. And then all of a sudden the cycle continues. And so what is happening literally in classrooms today, which I keep saying in my speeches all across the country, that what is happening in classrooms today is having an impact on their children's children. So this is not a, this is not a generation issue. This is a generational issue. So not just somebody today, but literally their great grandkids. Well, and it's even deeper than that. Those are lofty goals, uh, having a career, owning a home. I'm talking about being able to text. I'm talking about being able to read an article on Yahoo. That's what we're talking about. When we're saying that these children are, are incapable of reading, that's what we're talking about. When we're saying that they can't do fifth grade math, that means they can't look at a pizza and say that it's half eaten or a quarter eaten. They can't tell you what a, fr what a fraction is. They can't add um, 2.4 and, and 5.7. That's what we're saying adults are not able to do, adults, because they're in a system where the expectations are so low that we've actually come to the point where people have justified this academic stagnation. What they're saying is, when the kid comes to them in the seventh grade, they're saying, go to where the child is. What that means is that they teach below what the grade level is. So they say, well, how can I teach him algebra if he can't add? Because algebra ain't just adding. It's more than that. Well, how can I teach him Shakespeare if they don't know the, the words in there? You can teach sight words and you can teach college words simultaneously. Language and, and learning is not binary. It actually occurs simultaneously. But because the people who were being charged with the opportunity or being blessed with the opportunity to educate our children have lowered their expectations such and justified them, justified them by any number of strategies, one of them being because of where they are, uh, where they live, what the economic circumstances are, what their parents' education are, they 
They use that as one form of justification for low expectations. But the implications are real. I'm telling you, Roland, we're not talking about predicting six years in the future. I'm talking about right now there are 12th graders who are 17 to 18 years old who we've accepted, not in Harlem, in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is 24 feet away from 24 feet, a creek separates us from Fairfield County or Fairfield, which is one of the wealthiest towns in America. 24 feet. I have 12th graders who are reading at the sixth grade level, sixth grade level. That means that they couldn't read the New York Times or the Washington Post and tell you what the article was about. That's what we're dealing with right now. Those are the kids that we have right now, right at this very moment. Now your fifth school? In 2020, we'll open a school in the Bronx. And the district that we're opening the school in in the Bronx is the poorest congressional district in the United States of America. So challenging is this community that when we were approved by the regents, the authorizer in the state of New York, one of the regions said, you're going to need more than we when, when we can give you. Even the state acknowledges wow. it's that bad. The state said that on record. That's where we are. Folks, we have crossed over. We're in a whole different place now. This is not about charters versus magnets yep. versus traditional schools. It's a wrap. We are in a place where yep. academically yep. and socio-emotionally, our children are so far behind. When I say ours, I'm talking about black and Latino kids. They're so far behind that we're going to have to find strategies that are so drastic that none of us are going to feel comfortable with how much it's going to upset the uh, the apple cart. Dr. Steve Perry, man, always good talking with you. Keep handling your business and educating the next generation, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you, bud. Take care. All right, folks, joining us right now here in Los Angeles uh, for the XQ America uh, live event here is the CEO, uh, Ruslan Ali. Of course, uh, she, you might remember her working for the Department of Education uh, when she came on my Washington Watch show. She said I was too tough on her, uh, but she was used to talking to those people who don't send their kids to public school on traditional television shows. Uh, so it's a little different. Uh, and also uh, the chief, chief strategy and creative officer, uh, Mark Echo, as well. Hey, how we doing? Hello, hello. Yeah. All right, glad to be here. Glad well, to have good. you. It's great to, that you came here for us, and, like, this is amazing. Yeah. And look at how uh, I'm just watching you <laughs> quarterbacking all of this. Well, you know, the— Like, the, this is, like, you talk about the future media, of baby. media. Yeah. Well, the, so like the deal is— studio, man. So, I'm in, so they're talking to me back in the studio, so I'm actually connected via Skype right here. It's, it's unbelievable. On that phone. It's amazing. Uh, and so we're tweeting, and I'm also watching I the different it. streams. And people are, as people are commenting right now on all the different platforms. I love it. Uh, and so uh, it's all good. So, but let's talk about this event. Let's talk about XQ. And we can talk about you and being hard on me or not hard on me. Uh, no, I'm, I'm trying to tell y'all. It was so funny because Rosalind was like, we got, oh, when we was done, she was like, okay, you would not let me off the hook. She said, you were pushing hard. I'm like, yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. But it was good stuff. <laughs> it was. Because it was. then when I was Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights for President Barack Obama, we were pushing hard on doing what was right for poor kids and kids of color in our country. So and that's what we're trying to do now, too. You left the administration, you came yes. to Emerson Collective. Uh, tell folks, how did XQ start? Well, we started with the notion that we have to do something to help kids in our country, right? We started with the data. We look and we saw, Roland, you know this better than most. African-American, Latino, 12th graders reading and doing math at the level of white 8th graders in our country. Every country developed and developing, outperforming all of our kids. So we started with knowing we had a big problem and how to solve it. We also, though, knew that we didn't have all the answers, that community would have the answers. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lorena and I founded XQ on the notion that we were best as a country when we come together to solve big problems, that communities knew what they needed for their schools, and that an empowered community could design a school of the future. What we didn't expect was 10,000 people from across the country would come and join us. And together, we have developed out 19 models. We have a few states on the way, some districts, and we're really looking at showing what high school can look like for the planet moving forward. 
And when when we started uh, with with this idea of rethink high school, yes. Um, some people were going, ah, uh, this sounds sort of fishy. And it wasn't about tearing schools down. It wasn't about tearing teachers down. Of course not. But it was about forcing people to say, you can do this thing differently. Yes. You don't have to keep doing yes. it the same way. Yes. And you can actually make it interesting and fun and be effective. That's right. It was also learning from other industries. High schools have only been transformed twice in our entire country's history, after the War of 1812 and then again in the early 1900s. They have not kept pace with every other industry that has transformed and met the needs of a new society. It's about time high schools did as well. Mark, when we met in um, Oakland, mm -hmm. um, we were talking about uh, this idea, and then you sent me this email. And I still, I represent in my speeches when I'm talking to people. So for the folks who don't know, so explain to them uh, the information you sent me about Carnegie. Yeah. That, that literally explains exactly the how we got to where we are now yeah. and the problem that we're still doing yeah. it today the same way this guy laid it out in the 1800s. That's right. Well, in the uh, late 1800s, there was a gentleman by the name of Charles Elliott who was an ed reformer of his time, of his day, uh, who went on later on to become the president of Harvard, right? Mm -hmm. And in the top of the 1900s, uh, when all of the secondary education, like colleges were emerging all around the country, uh, and Carnegie being a, a guy wanted like quality control, was like, how do we organize this system so that uh, um, we have some, some mechanism of quality control effectively, right? How do we create a quality control mechanism uh, uh, within our school systems? So it started actually in the college, uh, the college space, and they came up with this notion of um, seat time, right? Uh, the idea was, all right, well, we're going to incentivize the, uh, the educators themselves at Harvard by writing, Carnegie wrote like a $10 million check, I think, at, at the, the time. time. Yeah. Which, what is now which, TIAA Craft. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So he wrote, he writes this, creates this incentive to say, hey, if you're an educator at Harvard, you could be eligible for this portion of this for tenure uh, um, if you adopt this system that's going to organize how we organize the kids and measure the kids in terms of the student hour and seat time. And the, the problem with this is, um, at the time, this was a, a, a very a brilliant idea in terms of how we organize time and space, the day, you know, the, the all of these things. And there's yeah, been a lot of folk, kids. What most folks don't realize is that at that period, first of all, you're talking about uh, 30 years after uh, the end of the Civil War. That's right. That's right. Uh, then, then you had, first of all, not a lot of white kids were going to uh, going right, to yeah. That's uh, right. going to school. In fact, in James D. Anderson's book, The Education of Blacks in the South, 1860 to 1935, he talks about that in, in, in Memphis, 92% of the black kids were going to That's in schools, right. while 41% of the white kids in D.C. were going to school. Yeah. And so... Um, so Again, my name is Karen Street. Um, I've been on the Hill since 2007. Um, uh, after a brief stint with Johnny Isaacson, who's a Republican senator from Georgia. I'm from Georgia. Um, look, yeah, hey, all right, okay, all right, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so you get on the Hill however you can, and I started out by working for Johnny Isaacson, and it's the best decision I ever made. Um, I then moved on to Harry Reid. He was Senate Majority Leader at the time. Uh, worked for him for about nine years until he retired. And then I made my way to the House. Um, so I think this time last year, I uh, addressed you all as policy director uh, of the CBC, but that um, put me in the orbit of one Karen Bass, uh, and I'm now her chief of staff. So um, over the course of, thank you, thank you. Um, I did, I did. and and. You know, com starting off as an intern and making my way up to chief, uh, there are so many black women and men who have supported me along the way. So I just want to um, thank you for the work that you do and the network that you have and um, for all that many of you have poured into. I see some of you here today. So um, the, the strength and blessings you have poured into me. Fifth term of Congress, um, she uh, actually, you know, way back in the day, she was a physician's assistant. Um, and I asked her why, and she said because they paid PAs more than they paid nurses. So she decided to go be a PA. So that's the kind of mentality that she has. Um, and in the 80s and 90s, when crack was crack and gang violence were 
destroying um, South LA, she took it upon herself with herself and a few of her friends to go around South LA knocking on hundreds of doors, asking people, how do we come together and fix this problem? And um, from that, Community Coalition was born. It's a nonprofit that's focused on substance